Hello, and welcome to the South Coast Artists Index, where artists, performers, and writers, as well as curators, directors, and supporters, anyone with ties to the creative community, drops by to introduce themselves to you. We'll talk about their beginnings, their vision, their passion, and so much more. The South Coast Artist Index podcast is brought to you in part by Heavenly Spirits, who invites you to celebrate the art of life and creative communities everywhere. Learn more at heavenlyspirits.com. Hi, this is Ron Fortier with another episode of the In Focus podcast, uh, brought to you by the South Coast uh, Artist Index. And um, as per usual, um, I want to allow our guests to introduce themselves and also to spell their name and, uh, you know, for the historic record. And we'll take it from there. I'm Brandon Cabral, uh, B-R-A-N-D-O-N, last name C-A-B-R-A-L. And uh, now, thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. And I'm not going to uh, uh, assume that you've ever had any difficulties with your name but then again, you just never know. I mean, sometimes the most innocuous names, I guess you could say, yeah. have the most riotous stories about them. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, how long have you been into photography? I'd say probably six, um, six to seven years. Okay. Um, I got into photography kind of when I was dwindling down, my music career was dwindling down. Oh, okay. Could you tell us about that? Oh, so um, when I first went to college, when I went to UMass Dartmouth, um, uh, a guy I went to high school with by the name of Matt Cavanaugh, um, very good drummer. I think he's a drum teacher, um, not in New Bedford, um, maybe in Somerset, at a school in Somerset or, mm -hmm. you know, locally around there somewhere. He asked me to join his band. And I was kind of like taken aback. I had never done music before. And I was like, what do you want me to do? And he's like, well, I want you to rap in this band. And I said, okay, that's kind of strange. He had known me as a, as a writer. I, you know, I used to write poetry and in high school and stuff like that. And um, I really enjoyed prose and, and things like that, the, you know, a play on words. And he asked me to join this band. So I went to UMass, um, the CVPA and uh, you know, music kids at UMass, they, they run the CVPA. And <laughs> they had like this little, this little uh, room set up and I, it was like 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. And I didn't, I didn't even know we could be in there. And they were like, yeah, you know, we're going to go to this room. We're going to practice a little bit. We're going to show you what we're about. And it was a full band. It was a drummer, bassist, guitarist, keyboardist. Um, and another another kid there who I'd known from junior high school, Christian Garris, there to rap. So the premise of the group was, uh, I guess, a play on the roots. So this jazzy kind of funky um, live band with, you know, rappers and vocalists. Um, and we, we hit it off and, uh, we kind of just, we just went off from there. It was, it was very enjoyable. Um, we added a female vocalist who was also a music major at the school and, um, we did very well. You know, we, we played in New Bedford, um, at the old Irish immigrant pub, which was at the time it was called Kirby's pub. And, you know, our friends would show up, you know, it's, it's not a venue that a lot of people know about. It's a dive bar essentially. Yeah. And a lot of our friends would show up and we got very popular, to be honest with you. And um, we started gigging out in Boston at the Hard Rock Cafe and church and all these venues there. And we were getting asked to go on tour and we played in Nantucket and, you know, any anywhere around this local area, you know, in New England, that was a big venue. We played. And um, what was the name of the uh, ensemble? <laughs> uh, it was called The Tree. Which, the Tree. <laughs> yeah. Which is like, you know, kind of play on the roots. And uh, yeah. It, it, it was it was amazing. It, it was kind of my step into artist creativity. Um, you know, I still to this day, I you know, I have I, I you know, the, the birth of my children is the greatest high I've ever felt in my life. But second to that would be performing on stage in front of, you know, large crowds of people screaming lyrics that I wrote. And um, it was it was it was a life changing thing. And we did it for years. We did it for three or four years. And, you know, we had those moments like like Spinal Tap, where, where you, you know you know we're fighting over just nonsense and stuff, and everybody kind of went their own way, you know, musically. We all started doing different projects. Um, myself and the other rapper Christian Garris in the group, we we got a studio um, at the at the Mills, um, the Kilburn Mills, mm -hmm. and um, we were making music out of there, and it it, it kind of dragged. You know, we would everyone was 
at different points in their lives. And um, I just I just stopped. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna give this a break. And uh, I had met a girl, and she wasn't into the touring and stuff, and the and you know like stuff like that. So I still needed a creative outlet. And um, I found a camera one day, a film camera, you know, and I was just thrift shopping for five bucks. And um, I picked up the camera, and it was more of a matter of I wanted to figure out how to use it. You know, I, I you know I know how to take pictures with my phone and stuff. I knew that I enjoyed that. You know that. Uh, you know certain perspectives and um i i you know we it just so happened that the following weekend we were going to new york my girlfriend and i and uh for a music festival and i took the camera with me and i shot a couple roles and you know you can imagine at this time i didn't know anything about film photography so i put the you know i loaded the film ca- film in and, sh- and shot a bunch of pictures i brought it to cvs on a uh, route six when i got home and developed it and when i first saw it the pictures i was kind of like taken aback like wow you know i was like this is really cool. And I kind of ran with it. And when I get my hit, when I get into something, I have to go all the way into it. So I, I kind of just dove headfirst into it and started learning about film photography, about the dark room, um, just the, the whole process. And, you know, it was always just, I just wanted to challenge myself. So I said, okay, now we have to learn how to develop it myself. I don't, I don't want to go to CVS anymore. I got to learn how to develop it myself. Um, but until I could learn that, I wanted to talk to other photographers. So I went to K Ellis photography in Dartmouth and uh, I met Ken and George and Ken and George kind of, when I first got in there, they kind of looked at me like, why the hell are you doing this? (laughs) And I was like, what do you mean? And they were like, well, there's digital cameras, you know, like (laughs) they they do so much better than what your, which the cameras that you have here. I was like, I don't care though. I I was like, I like this. It's tangible. And the fact that I could touch it, touch the film and and see it is, is what I really like. And um, they gave me a lot of advice and, and I, I go to that to this day and we just talk camera and talk photography all the time. And um, from that point on, I got into developing my own film. And once I started developing my own film, it was like over after that. I was like, all right, I can I can do anything now. And um, I, I built a dock room in my basement and um, I started enlarging my own prints and, and messing around with stuff like that. And that's kind of where I am now, you know? Wow, uh, it's quite a journey. Um, I'm gonna go, go. I'm gonna go back, back a little bit, back to the music. Uh, do you know Dempt? No, Kevin. Uh, uh, oh my God, I just blanked on on his on his real name. Oh, Kevin uh, Jose. Kevin Jose. No, uh, he's known as Dempt. He's a rapper, uh, you know, producer f- from around here. Uh, I interviewed him. He uh, worked uh, at the advertising agency where my wife and I worked. Uh, uh, work. Um, I. I, I do consulting work now. I don't work in the building proper. Um, <clears throat> and um, I was just wondering, because it, it, it is really kind of a small community. And when you come down to music in this area, um, you know, I just wrote a grant so that I could get another host to focus on the performing arts because I'm not that young. Yeah. And there are just too many people. I mean, I want to hear, and it doesn't necessarily mean I've got to do the interview. I want to hear about Paul Gonsalves and his uh, um, connection with Duke uh, Ellington's uh, orchestra and how he saved it and how still to this day, it's an epic 27 chorus solo that he did at the 1956 Newport Jazz Festival. And, you know, I would like to actually uh, get my, uh, my, former next door neighbors nephews Tavares uh on the show to do them individually and you know the list of of talent in this area just goes on i mean you know and and the connections beaver brown and uh, and it's just just so many uh, there's also a very sad story there too with billy payne probably one of the better drummers in the city and just completely went off in the wrong direction when he had so much guidance, so much genealogy, so much connections, but that's another story, but his story has got to be told eventually. So the point is just in the music category alone, uh, regardless of genre is like deep and wide. And then we go into photography um, and there is a category of black photographers that goes way, way back into the city. I mean, some of the very earliest photographers, you know? Um, So, let's let's put you in that historical um um uh, construct and 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 ask you about um how you know a lot of people run new bedford down 
but nobody really knows this city. And this city is like phenomenal. We're really good at holding secrets too. <laughs> well, you know, and we are from different generations. Mm-hmm. And, um, you, you know, my generation, we've always called New Bedford the secret city. And, um, oh, that's the first time I've ever heard that. Oh, so I'm, an, I'm a New Bedford kid. You know, mm-hmm. I grew up in Harborview Towers. You know, I grew up in Bay Village. You know, my great grandfather was a whaler. So, you know, my ties, I love New Bedford. I do. I love New Bedford with all my heart. So when, when you say like the history and the music and the photography and how, you know, there's so much talent here. It's something that I've always I actually just went on a rant on Facebook a few weeks ago about this, about this, this, this mentality that we have in New Bedford where, you know, it, it's, it's hard to support some of the bigger fish at the time, you know, you know, instead of supporting the bigger fish, sometimes we're at each other's necks. And, and, and I hate to see that because the, the, the talent gets shaded, you know, and, and, and that talent might not ever see the light of day that it deserves because of that. And um, I, think, I think it is important for us to really support each other, for uh, the history to be out there. Like when you just mentioned, you know, this, this uh, saxophonist, I, I didn't know about him, you know, and, and you know, that's my own, by my own fault. But I also think, you know, if I did know about him, I could share that with other people, other people my age or, or younger kids than me. And um, when I was first getting into the art scene in New Bedford, that's that's kind of what we prided ourselves on, you know, was like we weren't we were we were the anti old establishment, essentially, you know, and that involved a lot of at the time downtown wasn't what it is now, you know, there wasn't you know, all these shops, AHA wasn't as explosive and beautiful as it is now. Um, and we tried to take advantage of that. We were like, all right, so our city has this art and culture hub. How do we get kids our age involved in it? And, and I think a lot of credit is due to, you know, Craig Piver for opening No, no Problemos, um, Mondu at the time when it was open, the poor farm opening, you know, kids embracing, you know, dive bars that have been here forever, like, like the garden. But more mm-hmm. importantly, for me, the, the poignant time that that turned and made it is made it what it is today is Ugly Gallery, is uh, Jeremiah Hernandez and David yep. Guadalupe. Yep. And um, for me, that was the highlight of, of, of my week or my month, whatever it was, when they were having a show there. It was always an artist I had never heard of, not from New Bedford, who was, you know, had art that spoke to me as a younger person, you know, and um. It was it was it was the highlight of my month or my week. I would go there. I'd be like, all right, whose art we gonna go see? We're gonna run into a bunch of our friends. There's gonna, there's gonna be live music out there. There might be a little live rap cipher we're doing outside, and it felt like, you know, this little piece of New York. That energy that New York had at one point, you know, with with artists and, and Chelsea and Greenwich Village and stuff like that. That's it was like at that time period. That's how we. I think we all felt like that. People my age who were part of that you know, the Cummings building crew, you know, when Allison Wells was upstairs in the Cummings building, you know, I had a small studio next door to Allison Wells, you know, five seconds after talking to Allison Wells, I knew she wasn't from New Bedford, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that was but she okay. was way too happy to be from New Bedford. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, one of the, I mean, it's this, this weird kind of a thing. I mean, between I mean, Fitz, you know, Fitz, Fitz Carmel Lemaire and her, it's like, oh my God. Um, but they ain't, they ain't from around here. That's why <laughs> their, their soul hasn't been crushed yet. <laughs> that's the old New Bedford mentality. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You know? and, but that's what, and that's why I, I admire them so much because yeah. they found something here to fall in love with. Um, I remember, and it was so funny because we, Allison is so different from what we were doing at the Cummins building. The Cummins building is essentially a small space. We had a very small studio and we were doing all music. And Allison would be there during, and she had a small space. She'd be, be there during the day, painting, um, doing instruction for people, you know, playing our music. It was beautiful. It was quiet during the day. And then after all the artists left, we would be in there and we would be throwing parties that filled the whole place and live music. There was a little stage in there that we would perform on. And, um, you know, this is before Craig owned the, Craig Piva owned the building. Craig was the manager kind of, and he would just kind of let us run, roam free. But um, I remember when I would go there during the day and it was quiet, I'd go in there and I'd make some music myself just because I like that downtime. And I'd run into Allison and um, she had this she had this painting um, 
it, it was huge and it was on the back brick wall mm-hmm. and it was a cityscape and um i want to say it was oil and and uh maybe acrylic and the way it made it look was like uh this turquoise was raining on the city and that rain created this uh sculpted the buildings and the minute i saw it i wanted it mm-hmm. and and I, I didn't know about art at the time. I didn't, I didn't know how much it was worth. It, it was. It looked like it was worth a lot to me. I loved it. Mm-hmm. it is that the one with the uh, whaling museum? Is pretty prominent. The uh, the the the. I want to say the cupola like, with the whale uh, uh, wind uh, uh, weather vane. I'm gonna have to send you a picture of it. I think that one's bec- that that particular piece became iconic for her. Oh, and I every, I would see it every day. Yeah. And it, would, and it inspired me. And it and, and it and it just. And I still talk about it to this day every time I see her because at that time I was like, she sees this in New Bedford. She, this is, you know, she gets it. And um, I was so happy for her when she moved to the street, man. And I was like, all right, now people can see you from the street. They'll be able to walk down during an aha and see you and walk in and hear your voice and see your work. And, and you deserve all the credit that you're, you're about to get. So, um, yeah, I don't even know. Oh, the connection, you know, ugly yeah. gallery to that and to what, what we have now. Um, is a beautiful thing. I know. I know from your own experience, you you could see the difference in how Aha has changed into what it is now. I I remember uh, telling um, Lee Heald that um, I had been well when I first got out of the University of Miami. I came up here. I worked for Tony Souza for the Office of Historic Preservation, uh, and then you know all the cedar work uh, dried up, and it was like okay, it's another recession. That's been a story of my professional life. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to go back to cooking. That's how I got through high school, undergraduate, you know. So I, I uh, started working at Freestones. They had only been open like 18 months. And uh, at one time, really, we were the only light on in that part of the city. I mean, you know, you didn't want to go into the curb in the garage across the street. You did not want to go in there. That's what I mean. Uh, it's not what the people would bother you. It's that you would slip and fall on stuff that you don't want to slip yeah. and fall on. <laughs> and so I was a little cocky. You know, going to my first aha and like, oh, yeah, I'll just go at this time and I'll just grab a pocket. I'm like, what the hell is going on down here? <laughs> I have never not been able to get a parking space at seven <laughs> o'clock at night downtown. Right? <laughs> it was phenomenal. It was absolutely phenomenal. Um, and, you know, going back to the 80s, like 85. And this is kind of, you know, a touchy kind of a subject. The only thing that was going on. Uh, around that time on a Thursday night was was the gay guys who met on the steps of the the library because that was the only safe place they could meet and mm-hmm. it didn't it wasn't secretive because like everybody knew it so if you didn't want to deal with that you didn't go down there but that was about it and then of course there was the beacon on the hill which is the gallery X yeah. uh, but maybe they were just a little too hippy dippy for the more conservative you know connoisseur of the arts but really, there was nothing going on. And when you consider this city, you know, Alba Pinkham Ryder, you know, uh, uh, William Bradford, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Albert Beardstadt, I mean, the, you know, uh, church, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And that's just in the early days of art. And then you start coming up into um, <clears throat> other parts of the of the arts, the performing arts. Uh, I mean, Geez, I mean, we even have like famous chefs that came out of here. Everybody's like, oh, Admiral Lagasse. Like, no, he was a Fall River guy. Anthony Athanas. Well, who's that? Well, that's the guy who opened the most famous restaurant in Boston on the pier, on the wharf. Anthony's Pier 3, you know? Yeah. Um, so this whole thing, and then, you know, I, I moved to Portugal for uh, about a year or so. This whole thing, I think when the they topped off the, the Hurricane Dyke, for some reason, some, everything started to click. The boulevard made a big difference. Things just, people started looking around going, yeah, it's really not really that bad here. There's always going to be bad sections. And those bad sections can all be cured when we kick out people who own portfolios instead of properties. You know, we have live-in, we give tax benefits to live-in uh, landlords and multifamily dwellings. and But that's a whole nother soapbox to stand on, you know. Um Look at Bay Village itself, comparative to when you were growing up, right? So, when I was 19... South Central, too. When I was 19 to 20, when this was all 
it was just the, the, the rumblings of, of AHA and, and all these places opening up downtown, mm-hmm. you know, um, like the poor farm and, and no problemos and the Cummings building having more artists in it. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad, who, who's an in real estate investor, was meeting with a uh, New Bedford real estate magnate, uh, Joe Pontiff. Mm-hmm. And uh, I walked into the meeting and my dad introduced me to Joe and, and Joe said, I actually know you. And I said, oh, how do you know me? He said, I see you, you know, walking around my buildings all the time downtown, you know, and I there wasn't much down there. There was Simmons Brothers movies, rentals, was uh, mm-hmm. had just opened up and stuff like that. Destination Soups maybe might have just opened up. And uh, he said, I see what you guys are doing. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, you know, your artist friends, you guys go down there, you hang out, you guys are bringing, you know, more people downtown. Eventually, we're going to kick you out. And he chuckled. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, we're going to get you guys all down there. Then we're going to turn it into the Providence by the Ocean. And then you won't be able to fo- afford to stay down there. And I think that's what you're starting to see now. And um, it's a, I, I, I believe it's a pivotal point for New Bedford because um, as much as I love my, I love this city, um, I'm a very afraid of gentr- gentrification yeah. um, because the immediate area outside of downtown is Bay Village. Um, when you go down south, it, it's, you're heading towards Bay Village. If you go west, you're heading towards you know, United Front, which is historically black. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm afraid I don't want to lose that culture because we're celebrating the arts, you know, and, and, and the money that comes with celebrating the arts. Um, so, yeah, when you say Bay Village has changed and it has, you know, I remember I tell people all the time who ask me about it, you know, other artists, people who are invested in the city now, I say I used to run through the clotheslines in Bay Village, you know, and I know when the lights, when the street lights came on around Bay Village, I had to go home, which was Harborview, uh, Harborview Towers, and um, it's a strange situation going on there now. You know, you see the the big murals, the one that David Guadalupe put on the side of the the Bisca Club. Mm-hmm. Uh, oddly enough, the Bisca Club's up for sale. It just it just last two weeks ago, I think it just went up for sale, yeah. and um, it's you start to get nervous. You know, you're kind of like ah, oh, if they kick out our people you know, what, what is left, you know, just this, these, these, these condos for like, for people to live in, to go see the, the arts and stuff downtown. So it's a, it's a pivotal point. And, and, you know, I, I ask what's going to happen. You know, I've spoken to people who write grants and, you know, you know, uh, affiliated, you know, with city infrastructure. And they, and they assure me that the money's going to be invested back into the community and, and stuff like that. They were aware I, of gentrification and they really don't want to. I mean, just gentrification is, is, is an inevitability, right? I mean, that's it's, what it's a, it's a, it's a almost like a biological process. Uh, it, it happens yeah. everywhere. It's almost a natural process as awful as that, that, you know, that is to say, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking back of Verdian, uh, Verdian gardens, how long yeah. it took to get that thing on the, I mean, it took forever. My uncle Toy lived there until the day he died, you know, and it's, and that's what I mean. And, and that's like, I, like, I love it. I love that, w- that the city is getting beautified yeah. and stuff like that. And I the love old that CV that- club where the old guys out there playing dominoes. Uh, it was only scary if you didn't match the tone. Mm. And if you had no connections there. Uh, I remember um, my, my most vivid memory of, 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 uh, Bay Village still is. It was one of the hurricanes. And um, they had these trailer trucks and they were evacuating the people from Bay Village because the water was rising. This is before the hurricane dike was built. And I'll never forget that. Uh, It was like loading cattle onto a truck. Now, it may not have been the intent. That may have been the only thing. It was like the, you know, the fastest way to get all these people from Bay Village, you know, instead of doing you know, bus after bus after bus, they just piled everybody. And it just kind of like, I don't know, it just threw me for a loop. And it was almost like an Auschwitz kind of thing, you know, it's kind of hard to take. But let me ask you a question. One of the things that I find that's been very, very interesting with the entire art and culture, cultural scene, and I may, I don't think I'm blind. I mean, half my family's black. The diversity is phenomenal. I mean, I mean, you got Allison Wells on William Street, okay, next door to Paradise McPhee. Nobody's saying, "Oh, she's a black-owned business," and he. It, 
everybody is together. There's no dividing lines. There's not even like a gender thing. There's, it's this kind of really wonderful thing. I think um, as far as the, the art artist community that I know that of artists that are in New Bedford, like Allison, like Ryan, mm -hmm. like Brian Tillett, Dina mm -hmm. Hayden, you know, I can name all the, you know, Alex Jodden. Yeah. I can name you yeah. all these. Tom Bob, I got to get a hold of him. He used to work with me at, at Freestones. So, <laughs> well, you, but, and, and that's the little, that's the little divide yeah. that, that, you know, we, we have to bring together, I would say, you know, my days at Ugly Gallery, I'd only see young people in there. I wouldn't see this, the older artists who were around during the beginning, the first AHA, like I didn't know AHA was 25 years old. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It, it just, it didn't seem feasible. Like I remember downtown, like when you said, when you didn't walk around downtown at night, when the McDonald's was there and there was bums and, 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 and heroin addicts yeah. staying in. So although there is, it, it's becoming diverse, I'd like to see more diversity. I'd like to see the, the gatekeepers of the art community in New Bedford who are older now and, and more um, established to kind of reach out to these younger artists and, and say, okay, like this is what you should be doing to get more exposure. Or I know somebody here that can give you a grant, or I know somebody here that will let you have gallery space. And, and that actually, if I'm being honest, that's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it, um, the late Mark St. Pierre um, and his wife, I'm friends with their son, um, Olivier, and they had asked me to display some of my work in their gallery. And now at the time, I didn't think I was an artist, you know, I was, I, I'm an or a photographer for that matter. I just liked photography. And um, I said, you know, it was my friend Liv and I said, sure, I would do it, you know? And um, I hung up a few pictures, it, you know, like most artists, I, I, you know, I'm very critical of my own work. So it took me a while to figure out what I was gonna do. Um, what I did was a series of small portraits, um, a little smaller than five by sevens. I think they were like three by six, maybe three by four and a half, um, like almost postcard size uh, mm -hmm. portraits of people I, I saw around the bus station. And um, it, it got a lot of um, good feed. I got a, a lot of good feedback from it. And and I kind of, I just felt like, oh, like this is being an artist. You know what I mean? And people bought the work, which was strange to me. I was like, <laughs> I just, you know what I mean? I was like, yeah. why would, I don't understand. They, they bought it. People loved yeah. it. And um, yeah. that was kind of my stepping stone into giving me the confidence to be like, oh, I, I do make art and it is, and it is good. Um, but if, if it wasn't for Mark and Nicole, I might have not had that opportunity. And, um, and, and, and that's what I would like to see more of is, and, and cause Mark, Mark was a very established artist. Do you know what I mean? And I'd like to see more established artists reaching out to younger artists and saying, Hey, we do have a lot of pull. We know we've been doing this for 20, 30 years. Let's give you some guidance. You know what we I mean? You need a big brother, big sister system of art. And not right? just money, Ron, just, yeah, just yeah. some guidance to be like, yeah, hey, yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is how you do it. You know what yeah. I mean? And if this is what you want to do, I, I, I try it all the time. I, um, yeah. I met some young artists, this couple, I asked them to, uh, to model for me. I said, I wanted you guys to be the subjects of my, of, of, of some of my photography. Craig Piva let me use the upstairs of the Cummins building, no charge, you know, Craig's a great guy. And um, we shot a, a bunch of portraits, this um, process that I work in uh, where it's a uh, long exposure and I make mm -hmm. one subject look like a ghost. Yep. Um, it's about, you know, losing someone. And um, after I, I had never met them in person, I only knew them from social media. And yeah. uh, while we were working together and we spoke, I found out they were both art students at UMass. And um, one of them, the young lady, her name is Madeline, um, I started looking at her work and it's it's stunning illustration work and um, watercolor. And I was like, you are really good. I said, I, I really like your work. And um, I, I, not, I, not that I could give her too much instruction or advice. All I said to her was, I will share your work. So I shared it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but I would like to see her be taken under the wing of somebody and say, hey, you know, I got a little connection at this little gallery. We could we could do it. And, you know, and. And that's just, that's what New Bedford uh, needs in, in my eyes. No, no, you're right. We do need the mentoring. I mean, none of us got anywhere without somebody else. Uh, we either stand on the shoulders of giants, like our, our mentors, our teachers, and so on and so forth. Uh, or it's just that one person. And, and you know, let's, let's get back to, the, to the, the, the whole thing, like with the inner city. And the frustration of a lot of kids working there is because everything has been so 
exploded. Uh, there is no quote unquote nuclear family. It's not like you see on television, you know, uh, and, um, you know, the Portuguese word, okay, asking, okay, you don't have anybody for Padidish, you don't have any, any, your family so disjointed that you don't have an uncle or a mother or a father who are connected somehow to somebody, whether through employment, I'll ask my boss, or because they trade, well, you know, all the small businesses went to hell. In other words, a, a local pharmacy where your, your, your father, mother, or whomever was your guardian could go up there and say, hey, Sam, you know, my kids, he's getting on around 14. I don't want him to be getting in trouble running around with the wrong crowd. He needs some pocket money like most kids. He also needs to learn responsibility. He also needs to learn what it is to work. You know, could you hire him to sweep floors or stock your back or, or do something? That disappeared. Mm -hmm. That completely disappeared. So everybody became disenfranchised on so many, so many levels, you know. And then looking back at the diversity of the of the artistic community yeah there was a rift there between the young people and the old people um but i think the older people embraced the young people because what 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 uh, jeremiah and and david did was absolute batshit crazy if you stop and think about it imagine go to a, a bank and saying i want to do this yeah. um and they also showed this incredible connections between boston and new york uh they also showed you know what people categorize as urban art you know that's <laughs> owed for you know and uh but some of the stuff that came out of it was phenomenal and then they also gave credence and you know credibility to the street artists the taggers bombers you know whatever whatever the, the the term has evolved into and all of a sudden that started coming together and then the only other possible rift that there was was with jim charette um i, I uh, he uh, he had the the gunbolt gallery in the kilburn mill and he brought up a really, he's the type of guy where, you know, uh, between his alcohol and drug addiction and his personality, he, he didn't hold anything back. And during one of the uh, uh, open studio tours, he pretty much let off and said, hey, what about us folks down here in the south end of the city? You know, we don't have any cushy faculty positions that allow us to have a really nice studio up the north end. You know, we got a paycheck coming in. You know, we're here to sell work. We're, you know, we're devoted to this life of you know either you sell your work or you die you know and that was a that caused a whole bunch of changes and now there's not that right there isn't a rivalry that you would expect between the north end and hatch street and the south end and kilburn mill it's eerily coming together i mean i'm 68 years old and i have never seen this city you know, in my consciousness, you know, um, this together by this one, not even a product. It's not textiles. It's not whaling. It's not fishing. It's art. Go figure. I think it's, I think it's beautiful. And um, yeah. it's funny because I'm a New Bedford kid and it, I didn't even know about the art museum for, until probably six or seven years ago. I didn't even know about it. I had walked by it countless times. I could tell you my life. Didn't even know it existed. And as soon as I found out it existed, my first thought process was I need to get into the New Bedford Art Museum. You know, I'm, I'm an, I am a New Bedford person. If I don't care about my art being anywhere else in the world, I, I want it to be in, in our art museum so I could say to my mother or my grandmother and my aunt and say, hey, go to the New Bedford Art Museum and, mm -hmm. and look at it. It wasn't until Third Eye did an event at the Hatch Street Studios that I knew that I found out what the Hatch Street Studios looked like. And I went into the Hatch Street Studios, the, the, you know, I got on the, the weight elevator, the old elevator that they had an attendant there that day. He closes up the door. Yeah. He's like, is this your first time here? I'm like, yeah, I've never been in here before. You know, and I know it's an old mill. So uh, I'm, I, he lets me off the, the thing. I think he let me off at the wrong floor. So I'm just looking around. Now I'm looking around, going all these down these hallways. I'm seeing the different signs for different artists at their studios. Now these are all closed. I'm, I'm, the floor that I'm on is all closed. Mm -hmm. And I'm at the end of a hallway. I have my camera with me, so I'm taking pictures of an old sign or something. And I hear this gentleman say, hey, can I help you? And I turn around and I say, um, I'm actually looking for this event. Um, my name is Brandon Cabral. I don't want you, you know, as, as a black man, my first day yeah. thought was I didn't want him to think that I was trying to do anything illegal. Yeah. And he was very nice. He introduced himself. He said, I actually own this building. 
And ah. I said, okay. And he said, he, you know, he walked me to where I needed to go, but he was explaining to me what he was doing. And he said, I'm trying to create a space for artists here. And I said, well, let me be the first one to tell you as a New Bedford man, 35 years, born and bred in the city, I appreciate you for doing this because I didn't know this existed and this is beautiful. And um, I went to the event and, it, you know, it's third eye, you know, they got kids break dancing and, and uh, performers and stuff like that. And along that hallway, um, a bunch of the uh, Hat Street studio artists were there and showing off their studios. And um, my mind was kind of blown because, you know, when, when you leave New Bedford, you know, I always tell people where I'm from, you know, they ask me where I'm from. I'm, I tell them I'm from New Bedford, Massachusetts. It's the, one of the greatest cities in the United States. It was the richest city in the United States twice. Um, it's home to where Frederick Douglass taught some of the first free slaves English. You know, I, I try to break down a little bit of the history because I'm a very proudful, prideful person. Mm -hmm. And um, it, like you said, it, it's kind of insane to see how art has become the new, the new light. You know, we, we, you know, we're known as the city that lit the world. <laughs> now we have art to light the world with. And, um, in all mediums, you know, not just painting, mm -hmm. art, and, 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 and installation, performance art, you know, even, like you said, with cooking, you know, I look at Brandon Roderick with the baker, and I'm like, and I know him, he's a Cape Verdean kid who grew up around Bay Village, poor, and and, and I go there, and every time we, we chuckle about it, just like how New Bedford looks now, how it's able, it was able to come together like this. Yeah, it's... No hopefully it's no longer you do you have to kiss your kid goodbye when they get their diploma from high school or college because they're going to go away and you'll never see them again are we finally getting to the point where the people we've educated stay here so that's a that's a heavy question at this point right now because right? our greatest export up until <laughs> i don't know 15 10 15 years ago was educated been, youth yeah has always been the people and it's yeah. so funny you know um the Standard Times reached out to me and they did an article on me and my photography. And one of the highlights um, that the author had written in the story was that I invested back into the community by by deciding to stay here. And I never th I never had a second thought about it. I was like, I would never, and I've traveled the world. Mm -hmm. And my mom always says, you know, Brandon, wherever you go, you call me the first three days and you say, oh my, I love it here. I'm gonna move here. I said that when I went to Cape Verde, when I went to London, and, and I did. And after, you know, a little over a week goes by, I miss New Bedford, you know, and, and, and I always describe it as a small city, big town, but it, it's, it's mine. You know, it's, mm -hmm. I, I love every aspect of it. I love the culture. I love the food. I love the cuisine. I love the sounds. I love the smells. I remember the first time I flew into Las Vegas and I just saw a city in the sand and I said, I could never live anywhere, not near the ocean. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I know. Ocean at all yeah. times, uh, it scared me. In fact, I was like, yeah. "Where's the where's the ocean?" You know, it just, yeah. it just didn't make sense to me. Um, but I think you know, it's 2020. There's a lot going on, and I have I'm 30. I'll be 35 next summer, and a lot of my friends they're looking for property, and, and it's it's out of their reach financially right now. So, you know, you ask me, you know, is is are we coming back? And and that again, that that whole conversation of gentrification and. And although it's great to see New Bedford flourish, you know, and, and 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 people make money off of it, I'd hate to see the people who actually made New Bedford what it is and the cultures that made it what it is get pushed out. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And uh, I think that's where we're at. I mean, one of the big things, uh, especially, I mean, there, there was a there was a movement about ten years ago, probably fifteen years ago, that started, and they had different names for it. Um, uh, one of them was Reverse White Flight. Uh, the other one was revillagization. Uh, the other one was neo-urbanization. I mean, basically, what happened was millennials, especially. This is the the generation that was screwed, big time. They can never afford a new car. They can never afford a home. They can't afford to go on a vacation. So these are the kids. Uh, you know, I spent time in marketing. Um, these are the kids that don't buy the thirty rack of Coors Light. These are the kids who will buy a six or a 12 pack of premium beer, you know, micro brew beer or whatever, because their, their, their thing is, okay, I'll drink them real slow and enjoy every single one of them instead of drinking 30 cans of nothing in a can with bubbles. Mm -hmm. So they started putting, the, the point of that is they started putting value where value hadn't been put in for a long, long time. They wanted to move downtown because 
they could live upstairs from a cafe and go downstairs in their, in their fuzzy pants in the morning and get a, a roll and a coffee and go right back upstairs. Uh, if they wanted to go to the Zyterian, which they could afford because they didn't have a mortgage and their rent wasn't all that high and they didn't have car payments, they could just walk from their apartment to the Zyterian. And that's another thing. The city became safer and safer and safer. I remember when I had my office on Union and Cottage, I would leave my wallet in the office and only take the money. This is before people were using debit cards. I would only use, you know, take my five bucks and go down to Jimmy Steamy Dogs mm -hmm. and get my hot dog and commiserate with uh, Willie DePina. I mean, it was like a hundred years old and all the characters. Uh, and that was so cool, but you really had to be careful walking downtown. You know, you'd have people following you and, you know. Around the early 2000s. Yeah. Um, I well, actually, at, this was 80, uh, 90s. It was in the 90s, yeah. So in the early 2000s, I worked at the Java Jungle, uh -huh. which is now, I think, um, either apartment condos or it's part of the Quahog Republic. But um, that's when I would see, you know, and the, people who are your age now, they'd come in and get coffee. And mm -hmm. they were living downtown. And they, they'd read their books. So they were writers and they were all artists. Um, and... That I was in high school at that time, so th I wanted a piece of that. You know, it was, it was this this romantic romantic idea I've always had of New York, and mm -hmm. I was like, "There's no reason I can't have that in New Bedford." You know, I could I see people already doing that now, and 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 I want a piece of that. And I and we saw that progress and and into you know into what it is now. And um, I had a funny conversation with Craig Piver, the owner, of No Probs. One night, um, this is before COVID, so maybe around January, or February. Now I got three kids now, so I don't I don't make it out as often as I used to. And um, I was out, and it was just a strange night because um, I had I had, there was so many people out that I had known from that building period when Ugly was open, and and we were all kind of just all on the same team. You know, we were just like, this is cool. We want it. You know, even though nobody's hanging out down here, we're gonna hang out down here, and we're gonna do it. And we were all kind of having a conversation about what's happening now. It, it was January because it was, a, it was uh, a couple days after New Year's. And I, I said to Craig, I said, you know, I went out the day after New Year's. Um, I didn't drink that night. I think I stood home with my girlfriend and the kids and stuff. And um, I drove around maybe around 10 o'clock um, in the morning. And I drove, you know, around downtown. No one was out um, except people at Moby Dick Brewery. And they were outside drinking. And I kind of chuckled to myself because I said, none of those people are from New Bedford. I said, anybody from anybody from New Bedford? We have the common sense not to do that. <laughs> it just, it just, and, and, me, Craig, and Craig and I laughed. And we just laughed. And I was like, I was like, this is this is this is New Bedford now. I was like, this yep. is what New Bedford's coming. Yep. And and you have the decision to either you know be pissed about it and, and fight it, or we kind of embrace it and sneakily try to take that momentum and, and benefit the people who not necessarily really matter, but who deserve that, who, yes. who helped yeah. build this up yeah. and, and who have their roots here and who are yeah. willing to, you know, stay and, and dig in. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I know I, I keep repeating the same thing, but that's no, just, no, that's all good. That's all good. It's, it's the only thing that's been on my mind. To yeah. be honest. So what are you, what are you working on now with your photography? So, with my photography now, um, you know, COVID, it really did damage to my normal routine. You know, summer is a big time period for me to get out and shoot. I shoot a lot of street photography. I like to, you know, shoot natural scenes. I like to capture the faces of New Bedford. Um, the, the scenes that remind me of New Bedford, you know. I like to go to the South End Beach. I like to go to the T and, and take pictures of kids jumping off the T. And because of COVID, you didn't see that. People weren't out as much. I couldn't go out. Um, so it, 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 it really hurt, you know, and that uh, along with, I guess, the, the, the social and racial climate this year. It, oh, it, yeah, that, yeah, that's, yeah. Well, it was, it was very difficult for me. You know, a lot of people, the first thing they said is, well, are you going to go shoot the riots? And I said, I can't, I don't know if I could take pictures of, of not the riots. I'm sorry. The protest. Yeah. And um. Well, don't forget riots is. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other guy's term for yeah. 
Exactly, because yeah. they weren't riots. And I mean, yeah. we did have we did have riots around the country in certain places, but yeah. what happened around here wasn't necessarily riots mm-hmm. or in Providence, the, the protests we had in Providence. Yeah. Um, and I, it didn't sit well with me. I said, so what do I do with these pictures? You know, if I, I could keep the pictures, but what, what a lot of photographers were doing were taking the pictures of the protests and they were posting them on the internet. And I just didn't like that. I didn't, it just didn't, it, 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 to me, it felt like the message was being more used to, publicize individuals like this is you know like i, I want to show you what i can do and what i'm capable of instead of focusing on the message like black lives matter and they're killing black people and this is you know what are we going to do to stop this and i did attend protest you know and there was a day i just i stood out when they were having protests on union street i just stood out there by myself with my fist in the air for an hour i didn't you know i didn't take a picture um so for photography i just started picking up my cameras again to be honest and um I shot some pictures in the house over the over the over quarantine and stuff. I was doing a lot of portraits of just my girlfriend and the kids in the house and um, in the backyard. Um, in the early stages, we were taking the kids maybe once on the weekends far out into the woods for a hike. You know, we were like, all right, if, we, if this is the least we can do, we at least got to get the kids out. And I would take pictures then. Um, but I was just it maybe a few weeks ago, it just hit me and I was like, I need to pick up my cameras. And I really need to start working. So I started taking um, more portraits. I went out last weekend with some friends who are other who are photographers. Um, and we just walked around. We met up at the skate park, the overpass, and um, that's like one of my favorite places to shoot. I like shooting the skateboarders in New Bedford. The skate and 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 before I go on, they should always be included in in the group of people who have built up New Bedford. Skateboarders have done a lot for New Bedford um, in bringing people here. Um, and bringing attention to New Bedford. Um, I mean, Solstice is going on, what, 25 years? It, I mean, it's they're crazy. Part of, they're, they're part of the counterculture. Our yeah. art is counterculture, you know, yeah. and, and they're and they're a huge part of it. That NBMA thing that people take so much pride in in, in New Bedford, Solstice helped elevate that. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, that's one of my favorite places to shoot. So I went down there, I shot some portraits. I haven't developed the film yet. I'm excited to develop it, to be honest with you. But I know that I know they're going to be great pictures. But um, I'm trying to do some more portrait work. It's hard because you can't really, you're not supposed to be around people, you know? So I'm trying to work on some more portrait work. I I have an idea that I want to um, put into place next year. I'm hoping to save up enough money and, and possibly get some grant money to do it. But I'd like to travel to Cape Verde um, to photograph um, the people, the places. Um, I was very fortunate when I was maybe 19 or 20 to travel to Cape Verde with UMass Dartmouth. Um, I took this class just to travel to Cape Verde. It was uh, Cape Verdean political science. And the only reason I took the class is because the professor takes the kids on a trip every year for a week. So, so I was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to go to Cape Verde. I've never been there. Yeah. You know, the beaches are beautiful there. So it was a, it was, and I didn't, I guess I didn't understand the weight of it until I actually went there. You know, my mother was like, you know, no one in your family besides your great grandparents have been the Cape Verde, you know. Okay, uh, where are you guys from? São Nicolau, Brava, São uh, Vicente? Uh, Brava. Brava. Brava, okay. Which I didn't go to on this trip. We went uh-huh. to São Vicente and we went to Praia. Uh-huh. Um, but it was just like, <laughs> it was, it, I, I don't even know how to describe it. There's nothing you know? like putting your feet on your your land. We go to, we go to um, Sadad Valley, uh-huh. which is uh, historically the place where they used to sell slaves. And there's a church uh, right outside. It's the first church ever built in Cape Verde. And they built the floor of the church with old tombstones um, from Portuguese sailors. And one of the tombstones says Cabral on it. And the kid in my class goes, hey, come here, look at this. And I, and I look at it and it was just, it kind of just blew my mind. Yeah. Uh, of, you know, the history where I was standing. Besides the fact that it's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. And as Cape Verdean kids in New Bedford, you don't hear that. You hear it's poor. <laughs> You're like, you don't want to go there. You hear that it's poor. They had the drought. Everybody's, that's why everyone came here. So that's the concept of I, I, I had of, of it in my mind. And don't get me wrong. It's still a very poor country. No, but that's also what your parents told you. Because my mom told me the same thing about Portugal. I mean, she was born here, but her parents went back during the, you know, took her and her sister back during, like in 1929, during the depression. And she, my mother's always been, very political. I mean, she's been, my mother is the most modern woman that came out of the fifties that you'd, you know, forties and fifties you'd ever want to meet. Okay. 
and she was a circuit singer. She, you know, she's a fadista, sang father. And when I went over there, because my stepfather kept saying, oh, come on over, come on over to Figueira, which is the biggest beach in Europe, is in this town in Portugal. And when I went there, it was like, ah, you know, head slap. What the hell did I come here before? Because my mother would say, oh, a pobreza, blah, blah, blah. You know, she'd go into the whole nine yards. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you absolutely stunning. Yeah. And it was strange when I when I when we went there, what I was seeing and what was explained to us. So the so the the reason that the professor says he goes every year, the project is to try to figure out a way to bring economy to Cape Verde. Mm -hmm. So it's I mean, we, we did one day of that. And <laughs> the yeah. rest of the time we were there, we were in we were at the beach, we were eating, yeah. we were drinking and it was, you know, seeing the sights. It was, it, and it's just absolutely beautiful. But I was seeing the money start to come in. You know, they were building a hotel there, a huge hotel. And yeah. I said, "What is this?" And uh, one gentleman said to me, "He said, well, you know, this is Portuguese big business." And I said, "What do you mean?" He goes, "Well, a lot of people from Portugal consider this a vacation destination. Like they consider this their Bahamas." And I said, "That makes sense. It looks tropical. I yeah. get, you know what I mean. It makes yeah. total sense." Yeah. But I was like, "Damn!" So, you know, if <laughs> again that gentrification thing happens you know what i mean and you're like all right so i won't be able to come in you know 10 years from now i won't be able to get a uh eat every mail of the day for three dollars you know it's good that oh. everything's gonna go oh man yeah I, yeah I, don't get me going don't get me going <laughs> <laughs> yeah, four four five course meal for seven euro fifty come oh. on oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah 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 and then, oh, let me ask you a question the manchupa okay and 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 the jack and everything it's not exact it's different it, the first place we ended up like we watered it down somehow over here right oh yeah very very americanized yeah i remember the first restaurant we we went to that i could i was able to order cachupa they gave me cachupa rifragado which is like fried cachupa yeah. but the guisa that came with it the whoever the lady was that was the cook she made that by hand yeah and i was like it looks funny she goes oh they make this by hand here at yeah. this each restaurant yeah. I'm like, it's like they're not going to a store and buying it and i was like oh my god of course why would, why would why would i think any differently yeah. And of course, it's delicious. You know? Yeah, yeah. But um, I guess that's my goal in wanting to go back there. And it's a conversation I just had with my mother. I asked her to go with me. My aunt Val, who's never been, who's always wanted to go. Yeah, she's a New York socialite. She's lived in New York her whole, you know, most of her life. And uh, I said, well, why don't we go out there? And then I could, I'll use it as an excuse to photograph the people of Cape Verde and, and the places before it changes any further, yeah. so that we can show kids in New Bedford, you know what you know what where, what this looks like where they're from and stuff i think you just hit on a very valid point there and 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 maybe as a new bedford emissary going to cabo verde and and photographing the place and showing them this is where you come from this is you know i, I told you know i told my wife this story and my sister-in-law this story i had a i was working with bobby ford's got a rest his soul uh, for uh, umass dartmouth and he always he had the neighborhood college i mean bobby was a was a <laughs> As a snake oil salesman. I mean, he could get donations of computers. I mean, he was a hustler. Okay. He probably died of exhaustion and I'm not making light of his death, but anyway, so one of the, uh, one of the, the, the kids, uh, uh, parents, it was a single mother. This was around the time where people were discovering their Africanism. Hmm. So she was an American black. So she had no idea really because her, last name was more than likely her slave owner's name you know if it goes all the way back in the, in, in, into the family but she had the head wrap and the dashiki and the whole nine yards and she was you know she smelled you know Africa you know the, the 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 sandalwood i mean the whole nine yard black hippie kind of thing right mm -hmm. and she didn't get a formal or a good enough education and she was bound and determined that her daughter was going to get everything that she never got and uh, they were from boston and they came down here to live and her daughter was thriving. She was a really creative kid. And she, you know, uh, and she met me and, and, and you know, pretty much, it wasn't like the riot act, but this is what I expect from my daughter. Okay. She's like, okay, fine. I, I don't have a problem. I don't know how much time passed. She comes back and she says, I'm pulling, I'm pulling my daughter out. I was like, why? She's thriving. She's doing great. She's not, I, I can't deal living uh, down here. I said, I mean, are you having issues? Is it a racial thing? She said, yeah. I'm like, oh, damn. I said, what can I say? She said, no, you know, you don't get it. She says, it's black people. Huh? <laughs> she said, yeah, those damn Cape Verdeans, they're too freaking uppity and I can't take it anymore. 
I'm like, could you explain this to me? She said, well, because they know where they come from. So they're like really secure. And she, it, it rubbed her the wrong way. It was the most bizarre thing I'd ever, I'd ever heard of, you know? And, and it was that, you know, and then again, oh yeah, that was another thing she said. They don't consider themselves black. They consider themselves Portuguese. And she had a, she had issues trying to deal with this. It's a, uh... It's something I deal with all the time. Yeah. And, and when I say that, I mean, I try to explain to a lot of Cape Verdean people my age that they are black. And, um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I totally get what she's saying. I've heard it yeah. for years. Like people, when I was a kid, people from Senegal didn't like Cape Verdeans. They were like, yeah. you're, not, you're not black. You're not African. You know what I mean? And, and it, again, that's this whole identity crisis, you right. know, due to slavery, due to the transatlantic slave trade and stuff like that. And when black Americans trying to find their roots, yes, because we're in New Bedford and that, and that, you know, the whole Ernestina and that close relation to Cape Verde, it's a little bit easier to find your roots. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the black identity thing in Cape Verdeans, you know, I work in Brockton now <laughs> and, and those oh, are real yeah. Cape Verdeans. That's yeah. what I, I, you know, I tell people every day in New Bedford, I'm like, no, we're not real Cape Verdean. <laughs> I was like, these people are from yeah. Cape Verde. Cabo like, Verde. <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yes. yeah. They, they, they are from Cabo Verde yeah. right yeah. like right now. They just came here yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, that's a lot different than us. And um, we that's why we have to do more work into finding about our culture, um, not only here in New Bedford, um, not in there in Brompton, but back in Cape Verde, back in the West Coast of Africa. Um, but it, it, in New Bedford, it, it is, it's a, it's a, it, it's a, I have people like that in my family, you know, my, my Cape Verdeans in my family, we're, we're all different shades, you know, and, and people who aren't privy to what Cape Verdean culture is, they're like, I just, they think I'm mixed with white. They think, you know, you're mixed with white. And I'm like, no, you know, we're Cape Verdean. And, um, yeah, the mix happened way back when, you know, yeah. well, and yeah, I mean, yeah. Right. Like it's, and that's what I mean. It's a, it's a very heavy topic you know, well, with, for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, I, I've gone through this with my wife. Like she says, she didn't pass the brown paper bag test. And, you know, her hair wasn't kinky. It was wavy, so they called her straight. So, like, she had to deal with that, you know, aspect of you, it. I'll give you an example. Uh, my grandmother, Rosalie, um, she was born of Oliveira. And she was born of... I think eight or nine brothers and sisters. Um, her father, um, Omario, was a, a whaler, and her mother was a stay. My great grandmother was a stay-at-home mother, and uh, mm -hmm. she passed away uh, when my grandmother was very young, probably five, you know, well, maybe younger than that, three or four years old. Mm -hmm. and my great grandfather couldn't take care of all these kids by himself, so her godparents, who were Portuguese, adopted her because she was the lightest shaded one, and they changed her last name to Cabral, and. Um, she, I always grew up thinking I was, a, you know, my last name's Cabral, but it's really, my roots are Oliveira. Oliveira, yeah, yeah. And again, that's that whole shade, you know, consistency thing. Now, my grandmother would tell you she's black all day, you know. She would she would never try to embrace that Cape Verdean, you know, we're, we're more fairer skin, we have fairer hair. I think there was a time period where why not take advantage of that? If that's going to get you somewhere financially in a way that we could better ourselves and our family, yeah. you know, take all you can get from that. Oh, um, what's her name? Lawton. Uh, if you ever read Passing, I mean, that's like, and then my wife tells me similar stories uh, in, in her family as well. And and then, you know, there's that, there's that whole thing too about the lighter skin ones where the house help, yeah. use that word, the darker yeah. ones where the field help. Yeah. And uh, so there, and, it, and it's a weird because this, this uh, standardization, this uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, it was equal on like both sides. It's well, you know, you, you, if you were darker skin, you saw the lighter skin getting more advantages than you know. So it's it's a total it's a total crazy ass mess, you know. It's, a thing that, it's another reason why I take so much pride in New Bedford, though. You know, like we could call the South End Bay Village all day, which it is. Bay Village is an integral part of yeah. the South End, but yeah. let's not forget every street going on your, on your way up to County Street. You yeah, know, all the old mansions uh, were Cape Verdean owned mansions. Yeah. Those were all whale money. You know what I mean? Although they didn't own the ship, they were they afforded enough of money to, themselves to buy the purchase those homes. Yeah, we had and, our own 
affluent. It was almost like Greenwood, you know, uh, Black Wall Street. We had our own affluence here. We had the Martha Briggs Society, for God's sakes. Really, I mean, and those it was homes incredible. are still there. Those homes yeah. are still there. Yeah. And, and that's, <laughs> it's funny, a, a kid a little younger than me, he bought a house down there. And, you know, it's across from a well away. And um, he it's goes, a lady of, uh, of assumption for outsiders. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm sorry. And, um, That's all right. I, I congratulated on him. I, I told him, I said, you know, congrats on, on your house. And I said, you know, this is a historically Cape Verdean area. He goes, yeah, I know. I'm seeing a lot of Cape Verdean people out here. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of this, you know, music like this and, and, and foods that smell like that. And I said, yeah. I said, you, you know, now that you've purchased property down here, you, you have to embrace the culture that comes with that. And um, he, he, I mean, he's not black, you know, I should I should have led with that, that he's white. So I know it was a culture shock for him, even though he's from New Bedford, you yeah. know, he's from the North End. So he 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 doesn't have this experience down here and, and see what it is or, you know, his probably his first experience of the Cape Verdean Day Parade where, yeah, that that parade runs from Buntwood Park down Union Street all the way to downtown. But mm-hmm. when that parade comes to the South End, it's a, it's a different experience when that parade ends in front of the vets hall that you have to be there to see it and it really experience it. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm just, so everything you're telling me, you've got to capture with so that, that eye of yours. That's the, yeah. and that's the goal. That's the yeah. goal. And, and, and Ron, it was a tough year for me because like I said, the summertime is my time. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I'm thinking just right now, this image, uh, I got at blue meadows, South second street. Um, just randomly, you know, that's, that's how I take pictures. I'm, I, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm driving literally through the, the whole entire city, north end and south end. You know, I stop, I walk for a little bit, and I'm usually trying to take pictures of people of color, of, of, of you know. And I saw this gentleman sitting outside on his stoop uh, of Blue Metals, older gentleman, maybe in his 60s or 70s, and he's playing... Um, a concertina? Yes. Squeeze box, yeah. yeah. Squeeze box. Yeah. And he's wearing glasses and a hat, and I asked him if I could take his photo. He says no at first. And uh, so I start taking other people's pictures. There's kids yeah. running around, stuff, and taking pictures. I'm doing that just to get this guy's photo. I said, yeah. I need your picture. So yeah. I come back to him <laughs> and I said, can I get your photo? And now he's he's speaking Creole. I don't know Creole. So he's speaking Creole and I'm like, ah, no follow Creole. And this woman that's sitting on the porch next to him, she starts telling him, she's like, let him take your picture. Let him take your picture. So yeah. he lets me take the picture. Yeah. And it's, it's just a beautiful black and white photo. And you can see the crevices in his face. He's just an old man and he's, and he's holding the squeeze box. And, and, and that's what New Bedford is to me. You know, I grew up, I grew, I grew up around everywhere around New Bedford. I, I always say to people, you know, they tell me, I say, I didn't go to the North End until I was in high school. You know, I, I grew up at Harborview Towers. If I needed anything, I could walk to downtown. Me and my mom walked to downtown. If I needed anything, we'd walk right back to Harborview Towers. When we moved, finally moved from Harborview Towers, we lived on Sycamore Street. So Anything, you know, we, we had a car then at that point. We, mm-hmm. we were driving around the West End. There was no need right. to go to the Well, there was nothing around Sycamore. By that time, all those neighborhoods, in fact, we don't have neighborhoods anymore <laughs> in the city. That's the next thing that's going to come back. Oh. But again, how does that happen when people can't afford to live here? That's like, and that's a tough thing that's happening right now. Yeah. I'm seeing the, the rent skyrocket and, and Well, and, they said the rent's just on Church Street and the railroad station's not even built yet. The rent's and the property values just went through the roof. And it's like, you stop and think about it, man. You're going to be living next to a railroad station. You know what that's like? <laughs> and, and, and I'm not, and yeah. I'm not far from Church Street where this thing's going to be. And yeah, it's going to it's gonna make my property value go up. Yeah. But I don't care about that. You know, yeah. I, I, what I care more about is losing what I know, what I love, the thing that I yearn to get back to when I leave the country. Every time I leave the country, I don't, you know, the first three days are beautiful. I'm enjoying the place. I'm taking pictures. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, damn, I could really go for a dog from Jimmy's or I could really, you know, I could really go to Central Kitchen right now. Or I don't, I wouldn't mind smoking a cigarette and having a bear outside of the garden. Or you know, something like, it's just, it's just home to me. I can't escape it. I wouldn't, and not that I want to, you know, and if, if, if one day I leave and I come back and it's not the same, I'm going to be heartbroken. You know yeah. what I mean? I'm going to be, I'm going to yeah. be very heartbroken. Well, you and, know, uh, you know, we're going to wind this down, but, and I want you to come back. I want you to come back because, you know, the ev- invitation is open to everybody to come back. Uh, and uh, because wanna, you, you can't squeeze it all in there. What's that? I want to get, I want to get Carl Simmons first. 
I want to. Want, yeah. You, I, you, yeah, you have to. You have to. Even if you have to I hold will. them kicking and screaming. I will. I will. Uh, because there is a connection there between the two of us. And I'd love to. And again, it's a conversation. Mm -hmm. If I intimidated you, have I, uh, you know, put you in a place where you're like, oh, I don't know that answer. I mean, no, no it's no, a conversation. No. And that's what's important. You know, I, I, I mainly wanted to. And then, and then you know, I'm going to, you know, <laughs> Uh, telling myself a little bit but i listened to some of the other podcasts yeah and um it was it was i was more interested in in the fact that you know so much about the about the history of new bedford not only that you know so much about the history of new bedford but your experiences here like you know i, I heard you tell don burton the same thing about how when you worked at freestones when yeah. it first opened and it's yeah. just like think about freestones think about how that is it's like a point it's like it's a more it's a brick it's a cornerstone of downtown yeah. new bedford yeah My, it was my aunt's first job in high school was a waitress at Freestones. Uh, you might have known her, Angelina Johnson. Um, very, very pretty, light skin. Um, oh, probably. I mean, the only one I really remember going all the way back then was was Patty Wood, because Patty used to be the waitress. We worked. Well, she was already there. Gulf Hill Parlor in in South Dartmouth on the hill. The old Gulf Hill Parlor in Derry. Yeah. She was a waitress there when I was a, when I was like a fourteen. And she last I know when my wife and I went there for the oh the damn the lula the the the, the pushy style calamari oh oh god that's killer right but anyway uh, it was like Patty's still here oh my god it's gonna be like sixty freaking years you know yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah but you know you don't realize that you're living history or even making history you don't realize that until you have to have that distance and time to look back and then go, damn, I should have enjoyed myself a little bit more. I didn't realize that like <laughs> I was a bloody pioneer, <laughs> you know, but you, but you were and and uh, it's not something to, to scoff at, you know, and, and I, and, I, and I'm very grateful that I got to, you know, have this conversation with you. You know, I, I wanted to learn more about, New I'm always, I always want to learn more. About New That's mm -hmm. my big thing with Carl Simmons, you know, yeah. I, you know, I call Carl. I'm like, Carl, I have a question. I need an answer. You know, what's, why is this here? What's this? And, and he can give it to me. Well, let me, let me ask you, cause today's been a day of serendipity of like weird connections. Okay. It's mm -hmm. all been about connections and been a little psychic thing going on, but, um, um, Nick LeBlanc. Uh, I didn't know about Nick, uh, until I interviewed, uh, uh, Philip, uh, uh, Mellon for the second time. And uh, he's another guy that we could have like these conversations that are full of information and so on and so forth. And they mentioned Nick LeBlake. So he says, yeah, you got to get him on a show. I was like, okay. So I went and I checked him out because he sent me his link and I'm going through every one of the books. I'm like, no way. Brandon Cabral, how is this bloody possible? Just like how is it possible that Lowell Thompson is friends with Anthony Barboza? It's just, it, this stuff happens to me all the time. My my wife, believe it or not, I knew her sister uh, of her sister before I even know knew my wife existed. She's my second wife. It's a long, long story. Someday we have to do it over beers. But she was talking, and all of a sudden I went, "Is your sister the first black woman to be admitted into the Daughters of the American Revolution?" And she went, "How did you know that?" I said, "I saw her on the Good Morning America." <laughs> I've got a mind like a steel trap for certain things. Yet, if you ask me what I ate for dinner yesterday, <laughs> I have the foggiest bloody idea. I hope that uh, doesn't come back and bite me as I get older. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but it's it's that kind of thing. And then, yes, because of my age and because of some of the guests that I've had, I've got this incredible connection. I can fill in the gaps or whatever. But I also like speaking with younger people because um, – they're filling in gaps for me. And it's not about me. I'm just a, a guide on this whole thing. I just let the conversation rip. And if there's something that you say that I want to grab a little bit more from, I'll stop you, you know? I was going to ask you, how old are your daughters? I have a 10-year-old, a 4-year-old son, and this is the smallest one. She's going to be 3 in January. Her name is oh, Irie. Oh, God. Irie? Irie. Irie, yeah, Irie. Yeah. As in <laughs> reggae, Irie, yeah. Um uh, yeah, I, God, I can remember my, uh, my granddaughter, my grandson, my daughter. And now, uh, unfortunately they're not here. They're in San Diego is my, uh, my great grandson, um, wow. who, uh, looks a lot like me when I was a kid with darker skin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, but there's just something about this is the whole world right there. You know, absolutely. That's absolutely. the whole world. Um, so this has been absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Hi, sweetheart. That's fine. That's good. Hey, don't forget, this is COVID times. A lot yeah. of stuff we used to be all hung up about. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I've gotten to the point to tell you the truth. I'd rather speak with somebody on Zoom than speak on the phone because, like, stop and think about it. you're talking on the phone. What do you see? Nothing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's all it's all context. I hate texting because of that. Oh, it's like yeah, I, I don't have time to text this whole damn thing. You know, so no, let's no, just no. talk about it. So, Brandon, uh, I've got your information uh, of to do the post the, that accompanies the, the the podcast. At this point, it looks like you're going to probably be maybe January, February, because we back, you know, we've got them set up uh, way out. Uh, you're like number 66, I think. That's your number. Okay. <laughs> and my house, um, my house number is 666. No. <laughs> yes, I swear to God. I swear to God to you, Rob. Hey, this is just getting weirder <laughs> or, or more wonderful. It all depends on how you look at it. <laughs> this is fantastic. And yes, if you could please... And this is going to stay in this, this part. If you can please get Carl Simmons, he's one of the big fish that I've been wanting to get on this show. Oh, I'm going to talk to him as soon as we as soon as we end this, and also Nick Ooh. LeBlanc. Nick, Le, okay. Nick, you need Nick yes. LeBlanc on the show. Yeah, we got to get him on the show as well. Uh, uh, Philip uh, Mellon said he's uh, another another phenomenal guy. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Brandon, thanks so much, and. Folks, this is Ron Fortier uh, uh, wrapping up another episode of the uh, In Focus podcast. Uh, we'll see you next time. And in the meantime, please stay healthy and safe out there and be kind to each other. That's all you can do. Bye. We'll see you next week for another episode of the South Coast Artist Index podcast. The South Coast Artist Index podcast is brought to you in part by Heavenly Spirits, who invites you to celebrate the art of life and creative communities everywhere. Learn more at heavenlyspirits.com. To learn more about the South Coast Artist Index, visit theartistindex.com. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Be the artist you believe you are, and let's take care of each other out there.